I'm Chris Panabianco, Chief Marketing Officer at Securit, and I am joined today by Jason Costello, who's with Legacy Arms International. Jason, what's up, man? Not much. How are you doing? Doing great. I'm excited and as all heck, because right after this, we're going to go shoot some big guns and blow yeah, some stuff up. That's exactly what we're going to do. We've, uh, I just got to meet you. Um, Jason's been instrumental in helping our team uh, get this women's fire event. Um, we are in Arizona, out in the middle of nowhere, about two and a half hours north of Phoenix. And we've had a great, great week. But Jason was instrumental in helping us get this set up. Also being someone that has been a good advisor to Karen, to myself, to everybody here. And he is one of the biggest collectors in the country, we found out, uh, of antique firearms and just really cool shit. So Jason, welcome, and I, I appreciate you being here. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit how you got to this point? Um, you know, uh, thank you, by the way, for yeah. your service. And you're just an interesting dude. <laughs> um, the short answer is I grew up in Wisconsin. Um, I was not a hunter, but I was surrounded by the hunting community. And I think firearms ownership and, and utilization has just been a part of my life since I was a little kid. So I remember, you know, the first time I went shooting, I was probably four or five years old. And um, my first rifle was not a 22. It was a Winchester Model 94 and 3030. And I remember just being really unimpressed with it because I wanted some kind of cool military <laughs> rifle. And we went to the range to basically zero it. And my first three rounds down range went almost on top of each other. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the entire <laughs> world. So now I'm a huge convert and fan of the, the lever action guns. But I fell in love with it. And I've always had a appreciation for firearms. I've, they've always been a part of my life. And when I was old enough, I ended up joining the military. I served for a little under a decade and a half. And during that time, I had an opportunity to be introduced to some of the, the firearms that most people don't get to see. And um, one of my last jobs was commanding the U.S. Army Sniper School. And in that capacity, I really learned about the quality machining that goes into making a precision rifle, the training that goes into allowing somebody to utilize that to its maximum capacity or, or ability. And when the two come together, just how truly special that that experience is we worked a lot with the army marksmanship unit and that taught me a lot about handguns and shotguns and just platforms that maybe i hadn't really encompassed and ha come in contact with so you know fast forward i got out of the military i started my own business completely outside of that realm um but it it stayed something that was very special to me and something i enjoyed i, I always tell people my therapeutic you know, meditation is going to the range. If I'm doing long range stuff, I love that because there's a lot of mental process that goes into it, you know, estimating the range and, and deciding how you're going to essentially, you know, put a round on target at a longer distance. So I love that part of it. But I also love just going to the range with a handgun or a shotgun or anything. And, and I've just always enjoyed it. I love sharing that with other people. I think that's kind of my, the benchmark of who I am is I've, reached a point in my life where I'm fortunate to own a lot of firearms that most people don't get to own and most people don't ever get to see. And so rather than just kind of hoarding them and turning it into like, Oh, look at my collection and how amazing am I? I try to share those with other people, whether it's, you know, kids that are getting interested in shooting sports because they're the next generation or adults or just people that sometimes they're like, this is my dream gun. So it's like, okay, let's, let's go shoot it. You know? Yeah. You said that last night. I is one of the things I took away from that conversation was if you're at the range and you've got any of your guns and you see a kid, you go up and you ask them to come shoot and yeah. see if they want to, which I thought is really cool because as an outsider in the industry for a very long time, many people just hoard their guns and you know oh well that's cool nobody really says hey let's go shoot it right so that i thought that was really neat i think we have an obligation to to not only cultivate the next generation of, of responsible gun owners but to treat train them properly and safely and i think when you can take somebody under your wing and show them this is fun this isn't necessarily um you know this evil experience that some people think it is then we start to cultivate the appreciation of the firearm, its different uses, and and if somebody's going to grow up and be responsible and safe with it, then we, we've created a new generation of people to essentially perpetuate the shooting sports. 
I come from a military background, so it's very easy to have everything be about personal defense and, you know, the tactical applications. And I, I love that. I, I value it, but I love the shooting sports as well. You know, to me, it's fun to go to a range and put a bullseye down range and say, well, I want to put the rounds in the center of the bullseye. What do I have to do to get there? And I just, you know, recently got back into sporting clays and trap and skeet. I haven't done that in over two decades. And all of a sudden in one day, I'm like, man, I, I've missed this. I need to get back into it. And I, it's a fun activity and it's something that you can do and enjoy if it's from a sporting concept. And I think that then bleeds over into the personal defense and home security and things like that. And again, it's not for everybody, but if we can teach it in a way that makes it enjoyable and makes it comfortable, then I think we continue to grow our community and make people feel good about protecting themselves or, or enjoying shooting sports as a whole. What are your top three guns, your three favorite guns you have in your collection? Oh, I have a, um, I, I recently bought a Heckler & Co. PSG-1 sniper rifle. It's a kind of a rare rifle that has been imported very at a small number into the United States, and I just absolutely love it. Um, it was kind of that gun. I had a poster of it on my wall when I was 10 years old. So that's it's, cool. It's kind of one of those like you've achieved your dream, right? Right. Um, so I enjoy that. Um, I'm a big fan in my day to day job. I create things and I work with my hands. And so I've always had this affinity for firearms that are made by hand. Um, I, I appreciate the craftsmanship and I appreciate the idea that what a factory takes two minutes to do, a, a gunsmith will take days to do. And then the level to which it can do it is much more impressive. And so um, I own some 1911s and Browning high powers that were all made by a gentleman named Ted Yost, who actually used to be the head gunsmith here at Gunsight. And he went off on his own and he's considered to be one of the finest pistol smiths in the entire world. And so I feel very honored to have uh, some of his firearms. Um, and then probably that first, the Winchester Model 94, which was my first firearm, you know, and, and uh, like I said, it's just, it's got a very special place in my heart for me. That's awesome. And you just bought a gun while we were here. Yeah. I, so I always try to support, you know, different endeavors and Gunsight always has kind of a Gunsight pistol. For a long time, it was a Colt custom shop, different sizes and variants. And I've bought all of those over the years. And so recently Gunsight just announced the release of a Glock 45 that they're doing as a, a partnership with Glock. And so they had one here and I just had to bring it home with me. <laughs> it's uh, I, I try to always bring something home to remember, you know, the experience by, and for me it's guns instead Some of a t-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I bought a magnet yeah. Yeah. or a patch. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's awesome. So I want to switch it a little bit because we we've got a lot in common with our love of, Awesome watches, yeah. bourbon. Yep. But there's one other thing that I still can't get out of my head. You make custom guitars. I do. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I've played guitar since I was four years old. Um, and the truth is I, I never saw myself going this in this direction. I, I've just always enjoyed playing guitar. It's been very therapeutic and meditative for me. And when I was getting out of the Army, I went to graduate school. And while I was getting my MBA... I was actually pretty bored. I had a lot of free time compared to what I had in the military. And there was a gentleman down the street that made guitars for a living. I had zero experience, you know, building anything with my hands or with wood other than the Pinewood Derby car that I made as a kid. And I think, my dad, well, I think my dad made it and then yeah. I painted it. Yeah. Um, but my first day, you know, I basically offered to, to clean this guy's shop and sharpen his tools in exchange for showing me how to, to build an instrument. And my first day doing it, I fell in love with it. I felt that instant gratification of being able to do something and then see the fruits of your labor. And at that point, it was just kind of a hobby. And so I finished grad school. I went into the corporate world and got the really great executive job that my parents wanted me to have. And they were glad I wasn't in the military anymore. And I found out that I hated it. And so I did it for a short period of time. And I realized that I was going to work and kind of hating my life and then coming home at night and going into, at the time, a shop in my garage and building guitars. And I just thought, why not do this? And so I made a pretty, uh, pretty, you know, kind of no rational thinking decision, which is <laughs> unlike me. Normally I have contingency plan after con right. contingency plan. And this was just, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to move to Arizona because my sister lived here and I'm going to start building guitars for a living. And um, I moved here and I sucked at it, to be honest. Um, 
but I was able to finagle my way into a guitar building school that perpetuated my experience and knowledge base. Then I stayed on for a while as an instructor, and then I went and actually did an apprenticeship with somebody who's considered to be the, one of the top guitar makers in the world. And then back in uh, 2011, I came back to Phoenix and opened my doors, and I've been building ever since. And yeah. it's it's been amazing. I absolutely love it. What's hard for me, in all honesty, is my military background is kind of the foundation of who I am, and my love of firearms and the firearms community is is definitely kind of one of the most important things to me but I've found at least early on that the acceptance of that within the music community was very low so I had to keep the two sides of my life separate so there's Jason the guitar maker there's Jason the the firearms guy and until recently they were pretty separate and then when I started building a presence on social media for both of them all the social media f- companies figured out my emails were all the same. So they started cross marketing my stuff to, to different people. The firearms community has always, in my opinion, been very welcoming and embracing no matter who you are. Uh, you know, they bring you in and man, we just hope you have fun and you're safe and you have a good time. And I haven't always found that on the other side of the fence. And so it's been really interesting um, to kind of navigate that. And I, at least now I'm kind of at a point where I'm at a point in my life where I just want to be me and do the things that matter to me. And people are either going to accept me and embrace me for who I am or they aren't. And I, right. I don't really care anymore. So you've got two very famous guitars. You've told me about one of them is in a museum. Which museum is it? So that's in the musical instrument museum here in Phoenix. It's the world's largest musical instrument museum. Every country in the world has a display except for North Korea and the Maldives. Um, and that is, it's just a huge honor. You know, they, The museum is set up by continent, and then within the continent, you have all the different countries. And when you walk into the display for North America, my guitar is in a standalone display case, basically welcoming you into North America, and it's on permanent display. So, you know, quite an honor. Usually you have to be dead to be in a museum, so I'm pretty excited I get to enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, And so that's been, it's been a huge honor, and I'm so proud of it. And what I love is... Here in Arizona, uh, the Musical Instrument Museum is the second largest tourist attraction after the Grand Canyon. So every That's year, cool. millions and millions of people go through this museum, and people are always like tagging me or sending me photos of them standing next to my guitar. And it's just, it feels really good. That's it's amazing. An and the second one, timely enough, was for a former president, yeah. um, Jimmy Carter, yep. who regardless of politics is one of the greatest human beings um, for the way he gives back, but you made a guitar for him. Yeah. So um, it was part of a project. He actually planted some trees uh, in his property in Plains, Georgia years ago, and then cut down these trees. And he was looking to showcase potential uses of them. His intent was to sell off these acres of, of this Pallonia tree and use the money to give back to his community. One of the things he's known for is he, has provided solar power to everybody in the town of Plains, Georgia, where he lives. And he does things like that. So he reached out through a third party and basically said, you know, if I give you this wood, will you build a guitar out of it? And so I did, and it was presented to President Carter. He's an Annapolis uh, Naval Academy graduate, and I'm a West Point graduate, so there's that Army-Navy rivalry. And I was able to build this guitar out of wood that he grew and provided, the, the, the kind of the accents on it are all blue and gold to pay homage to his naval service. Um, but I just couldn't pass up the opportunity. And so on the back of the guitar in this decorative end strip uh, in Morse code, it says beat Navy. So I, <laughs> I feel like it was my only opportunity to ever punk a, a living former president right. in the United States. And I just had to. What was his time. reaction? He thought it was hilarious. Um, he was actually one of the most engaging people I've ever had the opportunity to interact with him and Miss Roslyn. You know, you meet celebrities, at least I do on a pretty regular basis. And you feel like their communication style is they have this canned set of things they say. So no matter where the conversation goes, you almost feel like they aren't listening. They're just trying to guide it to where they want to go. And you walk away feeling like it was very disingenuous. And with him, you know, he knew about me. We, we had a, a, an amazing conversation. Miss Rosalind was able to talk about, you know, the guitar and stuff. And just a fascinating person. You know, you, you just meet some people and, you know, that is a genuinely good person. And I was a young kid when he was president, so I've never cared about what he did as president. It didn't really right. affect me. 
But him as a human being, since he left office, I feel like he's been one of the most influential um, and positive people that this country's had between his work with Habitat for Humanity and, you know, just kind of working um, with, with people all over the globe to make the entire global community better. And what's been interesting is since I built this guitar for him, people have reached out to me to share their stories of their own personal experiences with him. And again, it's just been fascinating. So I feel like it's just one of those moments in my life that I'm never going to come close to topping. Uh, it's amazing. And, you know, I, I think you, again, I've only known you for a little while, but I've heard you speak to the group here. Mm-hmm. I've, I, I see the way you carry yourself. You are your true self and you are one of the most positive people. Um, you know, being outside the industry coming into it, you know, I had my reservations about, you know, it, it's a small small pond and I'm an outsider you and everybody that I've met you got you and especially you it's like this crusade to bring more people together instead of shunning someone because they don't know your military background is different than mine your ability to make amazing guitars is different but we get along man and I just think it's you're one of the coolest people I've met and just the stories um We'll save the watches for the next podcast, but <laughs> we do have the same watch. So if yeah. you can see his watch, um, you know, I, does that the, do the watches, do the weapon, the firearms and the craftsmanship? Is that part of a bigger thing oh, for 100%. you? That what? Tell yeah. me about that. Before so, we end. so I actually I got into guitar making because of my love of watches. So I when I first came into the military, um I just felt like I had kind of finally achieved something that I was super proud of. And I bought my first, you know, a nice timepiece. It was a Rolex Submariner non-date. And um, I remember I paid more for that. It actually wasn't that expensive compared to today. But right. but I paid more for that than I had ever paid for anything in my life. And I was so proud of it. But at the time, I was also kind of a young guy. and And financially, I wasn't really at a place in my life where I could afford to own something like that. So a couple months later, I realized like, well, how, okay, that was probably a a dumb purchase. (laughs) And I sold it. And at that time, to me, that watch was nothing more than a status symbol. It was 100%. The name was recognized by people. The watch was recognized by people. And I could kind of puff my chest and be like, look at me. Yeah. And yet it was all fake, right? Because then a couple months later, I'm like, oh my God, I can't pay my electric (laughs) bill. Um, So a couple years later, I went to buy that same watch again, and it had gone up in price. And I reached out to a gentleman. I don't even know if he's still in the industry, but he was in Nashville, Tennessee. His name was Casey Fuqua, and he had a company that sold pre-owned luxury watches. And he and I were doing this transaction so I could buy this watch again. And he started talking about how he had become a watch collector because he had been a sculptor in college that was his major. And he said, I don't understand the correlation. And he was the one that took the time to talk to me about, you know, watches and how they're made and things like that. And, you know, some of them like a Rolex are very nice. It's like owning a really nice Mercedes. They make millions of them, but they're beautiful and they're handcrafted. And then you have other brands that get into the Bugatti Veyrons of the world where, right. you know, they make 10 of them in a year. And the, the, you know, master watchmaker is 60, 70 years old, and he's been doing this entire, his, his entire life. And I fell in love with the idea of functional art, this idea that like, it has to look beautiful for you to want to buy it. But if a watch doesn't tell time, then it's completely useless. Right. So when I got into guitar making, my whole philosophy was based on that watchmaking and, and my watch collecting. It was the idea that I, it has to look beautiful. If it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, I failed. And I got into handmade, handcrafted firearms. I love, you know, shoes. I love, like, anything that's about making something by hand, I will sit fixated on it for hours, whether it's book binding or, you know, some leather work or whatever. I I was watching a video on kind of old sign making and gilding with, you know, gold leaf. And I'll sit and watch that stuff for hours. It's satisfying. It's satisfying, but it also reminds you, we're so used to everything nowadays being knocked off on a CNC and it's made in minutes. And, and there's not to say there's not the design aspect of the CAD drawing and stuff like that, but there's no heart and real connection to the product. I mean, I think of, 
you know, if, if you go into a Home Depot and you're like, wow, I really don't like the way this screw is made. Nobody's offended, right? right. Nobody really put anything into that. It's an assembly yeah. line. But, you know, with what I do, there's a deeply rooted personal interest in what I do and how I do it and how it's received. And when there are other craftsmen out there, no matter what the industry, if they view things the same way, I am attracted to that and I love it. So my love of watches reminds me of kind of where I've been and where I've come from. I typically only buy watches at moments in my life when I want to kind of remember them. And so they're significant in that regard. Um, They're symbolic of me doing things that, you know, maybe I didn't think I could do and I'm able to afford things I didn't think I could do. But the biggest thing for me is that they're made by hand and it's a reminder of that functional art that I kind of value in my life over everything else. That's awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Again, it's been an honor to meet you and looking forward to extending the relationship beyond this event. Definitely. And uh, we'll do this again. I can't wait. All right, brother. Thank you. Thank you.